have your Bibles, why don't you take those and open to Psalm 30. The book of Psalms is the largest book in the Bible, 150 songs. And we're going to read Psalm 30 right now. It's pretty much right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 30. Verses 4 and 5. page is rustling. That's cool. Thank you. Turn to Psalm 30. And if you would like to, while you're there, you can go ahead and kind of put your finger or a marker in Psalm 77, because we're going to be there most of the time. But I'd like to introduce the topic this morning from Psalm 30. So we're going to start Psalm 30, then go to Psalm 77. Psalm 30 verses 4 and 5 says this, sing to the Lord, all you godly ones, praise his name, his holy name. For his, why are we praising God? Why are we singing to God? Because his anger lasts only a moment. Praise God for that, right? His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Father, I thank you for your, for your blessings. I thank you for your presence. And I pray, God, that you would illuminate our hearts today, encourage us today with your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, listen, over the course of the last few weeks, maybe even a little bit longer than that, I've sensed a heaviness in the sanctuary. When I come in, when I come up to transition between worship and, and the word, a lot of times... I just sense what what you're carrying, and it seems like there's an awful lot of people who are carrying a heavy load or or people who are in a season of difficulty. And I just, right out of the gate this morning, I just want to encourage you from the Word, right, right 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 from the beginning today. Weeping may endure for the night, but can I tell you, joy is coming. Joy is coming. It's not always going to be midnight where you are. It's not always going to be this dark. It's not always going to be this difficult. There are times and seasons. And if there's one thing I've learned in my half century on this planet, it's that seasons change. For good or for bad, for better or for worse, seasons are going to change. So be encouraged today. It might be midnight where you are right now, but morning is coming. Morning is coming. And so I want us to spend some time with that concept today. And if you'll go ahead and flip over to Psalm 77, I want us to talk about this idea of midnight to morning. Midnight to morning. And if you're in a midnight season, I want you to be encouraged. And if you're not in a midnight season, I want you to take note. I want you to learn some things and remember these lessons because there will come a time when you're going to need them. So the question today that we're trying to answer is this. How do I move from midnight to morning? How do I move from midnight to morning? And we're going we're gonna to look at Psalm 77 to try to help us find that path. As a matter of fact, when you look at Psalm 77, um, even before the first verse, you're like, I didn't know there was stuff before the first verse. There is in the Psalms. And there's a little tag there that says for, uh, for Jedithan, the choir director, a psalm of Asaph. For the, it's for the choir director. Now, most of the time, I don't know if you're like me, most of the time I kind of skip over those little things. Anybody want to be honest in the house of the Lord? Like, okay, whatever, let's get to number two. Verse one. Um, but this one caught my eye for some reason as I was reading. And, and, and this is a psalm about what a lot of people call the dark night of the soul. It's when God just seems like he's a million miles away. But this little seemingly insignificant tag tells me that a man named Asaph wrote this psalm. It's a song, really. All of these psalms are songs, and he wrote them to be sung by a choir in worship. Why is that? Because it's so relatable. Because this idea is so universal. Because every person I know has been through a midnight experience. Sometimes it only lasts for a night, but really most of the time, it's a midnight experience that's a season 
that lasts for days, sometimes for weeks or for months. There will come a time in every believer's life when you are put through what the Bible calls a fiery trial or a wilderness experience or like we're talking about, a midnight experience. Whatever you call it, it feels like you're walking a very dark road all by yourself. So before we even start to break down this psalm, be encouraged this morning. You are not alone. You're not alone. You see, part of the plot of the enemy in these seasons is to make you feel like you're the only one, like God is picking on you. It's a lie. It's a lie. There is a choir of people from every generation, in every church, in every group of believers that you're ever going to be with who have been, who will be, or who are where you are today. So be encouraged that you are not alone. All right? All right? You're not alone. Look at the person beside you and say, you're not alone this morning. All right, so let's dive in and find out how to get from morning, from midnight to morning. First of all, moving from midnight to morning requires spiritual honesty. Spiritual honesty. See, I love the Psalms. I'm, I'm learning to love and appreciate the Psalms because they are often bare bones expressions of the soul. Hey, sometimes in deep gratitude for the goodness of God, Sometimes with great excitement over a victory that God has brought into, into our lives. And sometimes, like this psalm is, Psalm 77, it, it's an expression of great distress over a midnight experience. And this psalmist gives us an important lesson that, if I can be honest with you, I was never taught as a child growing up in church. And it's spiritual honesty. It's the permission that you give yourself to bear your soul to your creator without guilt and without shame. Let me, I want to say that again because I want, you to, I want you not to miss this for like 50 years like I did. Spiritual honesty is the permission you give yourself to bear your soul to your creator without guilt and without shame. Listen, God, God is neither intimidated nor offended by your honesty. If we, if we believe that God is, om, is omnipotent, that he, he's all-powerful, and that he's omniscient, that he knows everything, then why is it we try to keep secrets from him? He already knows. So, so it's, it's important for us to, to be honest with him. As a matter of fact, I think he desires that we are honest with him because it's only when a person gets real that any authentic life change can happen. So let's look at a few verses and see if we can figure out what, what we're talking about here. So Psalm 77, let's look, look at the first three verses. There's a little tag for, Jed, for Jedithan, the choir director. Uh, he says this, Asaph says, I cry out to God. Yes, I shout, oh, that God would listen to me. In verse two, when I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven, but my soul was not comforted. Listen, you don't hear that in churches anymore. <laughs> Nobody says that. It's all this positive and inspirational stuff. This dude said, I searched for God all night and never found him. I think of God and I moan overwhelmed with longing for his help. Asaph says, I was in deep trouble. I was in a mess. I cried out to God, but I didn't, he didn't appear to hear me, and I didn't receive any comfort. I love how he describes it. He said, I lifted my hands. I cried. I shouted. I prayed. I moaned. I searched. In other words, I'm doing what I've always done to connect with God, but God is nowhere to be found. What I've always done is not working. You ever been in that spot? I have. You think, if there was ever a time when I needed to hear him or feel him, it's now, and I can't find him. So what in the world is going on? I thought he had promised never to leave us and never to forsake us, but I feel both left and forsaken. 
And that kind of spiritual honesty is important. God wants you to be honest with him, not because he doesn't already know, but because you need to say it. Sometimes you need to hear yourself say it. Now listen, I know there's power in our words. I get that. That's maybe, that's Valerie's favorite verse. She says that all the time. The kids laugh when they hear that, that scripture because Valerie beat that into their heads. There's power in our words. I get that. And I know that our confession is powerful and we have to watch what we say. But there is also a time when you need to speak into the light what the enemy is whispering to you in the darkness. You need to expose those lies so that the light of Jesus can illuminate it. And that's why spiritual honesty is so important. You're dealing so many years, I dealt with stuff on the inside, terrified to say them into the light because I was afraid I was going to get zapped. Right? Because we've based our theology on Greek mythology and not on the Bible. Let's look at the next few verses, four through six. The psalmist said, You don't let me sleep. <laughs> I am too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days, long since ended, <laughs> when my nights were filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and ponder the difference now. For most people, this dark night of the soul is a tough time to sleep. You go through these seasons and you ain't had a good night's sleep in weeks. You lie awake at night and you ponder your plight. You wonder what you're going to do. You run scenarios. Anybody do this in the middle of the night besides me? You run scenarios in your head all night long, and they're all worst-case scenarios, right? You go from one nightmare outcome to another. You think about what it was like before this whole thing started, how easy it used to be in God's presence, how grateful you were to him for what he had done in your life, how, how, how easy it was for you to feel him and to hear him and to know his will and to sense his direction, but now it's all changed and you don't really know why. And you wonder, like Asaph, if you did something wrong. And what happens when you start wondering that, those, those kinds of things is that um, suddenly your friends appear. And I don't mean your real friends, your godly friends, your encouraging friends. I mean friends like Job's friends. So they suddenly show up and they begin to help you blame yourself for everything that's going on in your life. They, they start in on you. Oh, well, you must have sin in your life. You need to search your heart because God has brought this on you because you're such a rank sinner. He has turned his back on you because he, he can't look on all that sin that's in your life. You need to repent, and you need to repent right now, right? And I'm telling you, it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. Just like God places people in your life with the right word in the right season, the enemy tries to mimic him and do the same thing. The wrong person in the wrong season with the wrong word. Just because somebody shows up out of the blue with a quote word does not mean that God sent them and that what they say is the truth. Amen. Several years ago, I had a family member who was diagnosed with a brain tumor while she was pregnant with her first child. And you wouldn't believe the so-called prophets and discerners who showed up in her life and told her that she was a, sin a sinner. Understand the context here. She's wondering if she's going to live to see the birth of the child that she's carrying, and these people are just wailing on her. I mean, did she ever commit a sin? Sure she did, just like everybody else. But surely she's not like a brain tumor level sinner. Like maybe a broken toe sinner or something like that, whatever. But what kind of sin do you have to do for God to zap you with a brain tumor? And what kind of messed up theology is that anyway? Is that not ridiculous? Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. John 9, verses 1 through 3. He said, Jesus walking along, they saw a blind man who'd been blind from birth, 
And his disciples said, Rabbi or teacher, why was this man born blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? You see, there's only an A or a B. (laughs) Jesus said, it's not because of his or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Jesus is saying, would y'all calm down, please? Sometimes there are things going on here that are beyond our ability to comprehend. Sometimes it's not A or B. Sometimes there's a C. So quit trying to label everything and put everything into your neat little boxes. Sometimes some things in life are messy. Some things are undefined, at least for a while. Some things you're just not going to be able to wrap your mind around the season in which you experience them. See, the old cliche is that life is lived forwards but is understood backwards. It takes some time and some perspective before you understand some things. And sometimes you're never going to understand everything that happens in your life. So Asaph is walking through this spiritual honesty in owning his frustration and his confusion with his situation. Let's keep reading. In verses 7 through 9, let's look at what he continues to say. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? You see, when you've searched your life and repented of everything you can think of because you think your sin caused your season, then the natural progression is to begin to wonder and to question God and his character. Is it me, God, or is it you? Did I do something wrong to make you leave me? Or are you just not the God I thought you were? He promised to love me, so why do I feel so unloved? He promised to accept me, to call me his own. Why do I feel so rejected? He made promises to me. Why has he failed to keep his promises? He's supposed to be a God of grace, but here I am in this predicament. He's an all-seeing, all-knowing God who knows I need him, and yet here I am without even a little bit of compassion from him. So you tried to blame yourself, but you ran out of stuff to justify what you're going through and what you're feeling, so now you start to blame God. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but let me tell you this. That's okay. It's okay. If that's how you feel, that's okay. And you need to say it. And you need to speak it to him. For a while, it is perfectly fine to be offended with God if that's how you feel. If you need to cry and rant and rave at God, it's okay. Walk through your midnight with a level of spiritual honesty that will keep the lines of communication open. Because listen, he'd rather you yell at him than not talk to him at all. Everybody okay? Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. If your midnight experience lasts long enough, eventually your human nature will begin to cause you to accept a, a negative circumstance as the new norm. People can be in incredibly difficult situations, and somehow their minds begin to figure out how to make it normal, how to normalize the new situation so they can just survive. And that's where Asaph is. And maybe that's where you are today. You're thinking, this is just the way it's going to be for me now. This is just my relationship with God now. Here's what you do. You move from spiritual honesty to spiritual memory. Spiritual memory. I want to show you the next two verses, 11 and 12. This is what he begins to say. But then I recall 
all you've done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts, and I can't stop thinking about your mighty works. Remember the Lord and his track record. This is your turning point in your midnight experience. When your spiritual honesty leads you back to all the things that the Lord has already done in your life. I want you to see that first word, but. But. But is a conjunction. It connects words and phrases and clauses. Is anybody singing Schoolhouse Rock? (laughs) Conjunction, conjunction. Anyway. It's different than a lot of conjunctions in that it doesn't just connect the thoughts, it changes the direction of the thoughts. It hooks them up. (laughs) Sorry. It connects them, but it changes the track. Okay? In this case, it's the thought process. Here's what he's thinking. He's thinking things are going badly. I'm reaching out to God. God's not reaching back. Maybe just, this is just the relationship I'm going to have with the Lord today. That's the direction his thought process is going. And then comes this word, but. And it changes the direction of the thought process. It is, as Pastor Robbie said last week, the pivot. It's the pivot. Listen, it's not denying or discounting anything that was spoken before It's not pushing back against it. It's simply accepting that perhaps there's a different way to look at it. That what feels like a dead end may really just be a detour if you'll dare to move in that direction. And this change is subtle, but it's powerful. It doesn't dispute your facts. It simply presents a different conclusion. Does that make sense? It says, yes, you feel this way. Yes, this happened to you. Yes, you're discouraged and broken and upset. Yes, it's midnight in your life. But remember all the things that God has done for you over all the years. Remember the blessings. Remember the experiences. Remember the moments of intimacy. Don't just use your spiritual honesty to assess where you are. Use your spiritual memory to help point you towards a more honest conclusion. See, if you only view God from the season that you're in right now, you're going to malign his character and mistake his nature. You're going to miss what he's doing because of the lens of your midnight experience. But if you only capture one segment of somebody's life, it's impossible to fully understand what's really going on. Let me say that again. If you only capture one segment of somebody's life, it's it's impossible to know what's really happening. Think of driving a nail. Anybody ever used a hammer to drive a nail? If you you divide that process into half-second segments, think of videoing it and just cutting it into half-second segments. How do you think you're going to feel if you only see the backswing? What are you going to think? You're going to think, well, good Lord, the nail's down there. And the hammer's going in the complete opposite direction. But wouldn't you agree with me that the backswing is what determines the effectiveness of the nail driving process? Is anybody going to talk to me this morning? I ain't no no construction dude, but I've driven a nail. Y'all driven a nail, right? All right? Don't only focus on the backswings of your life. See the whole process. Remember the processes that you've seen before. Remember how God has used every circumstance and turned them into something powerful and positive and beautiful in your life. It doesn't deny the facts. The hammer really is moving away from the nail in that stage, but it's simply helping you to put context around it. That's the power of spiritual memory. It reminds you that not everything is what it, what it seems to be. And, it's, and just what you feel is not necessarily an indication of reality. See, I've had seasons in my life where it seemed like things were going absolutely backwards, where God wouldn't hear me and I sure couldn't hear him. 
when his silence made me question both his existence and his goodness. But if I have to be completely spiritually honest, and if I had to really allow myself some spiritual memory to work right then, then I would have recognized that even then, in the midst of my midnight, I could not stop thinking about the works of the Lord. And listen, this sounds crazy, but somebody's going to understand what I'm saying. In, in the most difficult time of my life, I discovered it's possible to feel both abandoned and secure at the same time. Is that not the craziest thing? Where you are convinced that God has abandoned you, but if you're really drilled down to, to, the, to your honesty, you know that he's also cradling you. What? But it, I didn't feel God, but somehow despite myself, I knew he was there. I also discovered it's somehow possible to be both annoyed with God and anointed by God. You've heard me say this before. I know what it's like to lead people in worship from this platform, uh, leading people to worship a God that at that moment I wasn't sure he existed. Or if he existed, I wasn't sure he was good. But despite what I was going through on the inside, I was seeing God use me to draw people to himself, to experience him in powerful and personal ways. Even though I was numb from my midnight experience, though my soul was crushed, he was using the crushing process to squeeze out an anointing that was pure and powerful and way more important than how I felt about it. So if you're in that season where you feel like you're going through the motions, keep walking. Keep walking. And don't, don't believe that God can only use you when you're feeling it because that's not what faith is about. I also discovered in that season, in the dark night of the soul, that it's possible to be both empty and full at the same time. Completely empty of any emotional or spiritual strength in and of myself. But that in my weakness, he was made strong. That in my complete inability to help myself, he was helping people through me. And I found that out of my emptiness was the perfect conduit for his power and for his pleasure because when he flows through a completely empty vessel, then it's unobstructed by me. And in those moments, I was too weak to resist the flow of his power anyway. And so here's the last stage to help move from midnight to morning. Verses 13 through 20. We're going to roll through these quick, okay? Oh God, your ways are holy. Do you, do you sense a change in the atmosphere, a change in the tone in his life? Your ways are holy. Oh God, is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the Red Sea saw you, O oh God, its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured rain down. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea, a pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one else knew was there. You led your people along the road like a flock of sheep with Aaron and Moses as their shepherds. See, at some point, you have to encourage yourself in the Lord by remembering not just all the times he delivered you and helped you, but by seeing who God truly is from Scripture helping people in he helped people who are in worse circumstances than you're in 
remembering the awe-inspiring power of God, remembering the times that because of simple faith, he made a way where there was no way. And I'm calling it spiritual integrity because at some point in your midnight experience, you will learn a valuable lesson. You will learn that not everything is about you. Shocking to an American audience, I know. But not everything is about you. That God doesn't serve us. We serve him. That just like Jesus said about the blind man, some things are allowed or even brought into our lives so that the power of God can be demonstrated in us. See, when you start to rehearse the goodness of God from the Scripture, when you rehearse the character of God from the Word, the nature of God, not just in your own current circumstance, but historically, through history, integrity requires that you admit that God is greater than your circumstance, that God is working, that God is moving, that God is sovereign, that God is mighty and powerful, yes, but he is also incredibly, unchangingly good. You see, I believe that the more you think about the goodness of the Lord, something strange will begin to happen to you. You will begin to encourage yourself in the Lord. That faith will rise because you're hearing the word of God, and that's where faith comes from. That hope will rise. That joy will develop. And joy is a funny thing because it's not a giddy happiness that happens because everything's going right or because you get the outcome that you wanted. Joy is this abiding satisfaction and peace that comes from resting in the palm of God's hand and trusting that no matter what the outcome is, you always win. That's joy. You see, joy is important. Why? Because our opening scripture said that joy comes with the morning, that once you start to walk in joy, it can't be long before your midnight will break and your morning will dawn because, because joy comes with the morning. So get yourself into the word, pour yourself into it, pour the word into yourself, get yourself into some good biblically sound worship. Allow the word to encourage you and to saturate you and to lead you to joy because joy and mourning changes everything. Changes everything. Now listen, I've got, this is, this is a heck of an introduction here. I have uh, no idea if this is historically accurate, but it's a good story, okay? So I'm going to tell it anyway. I am told that in, in the ancient native cultures that the transition from boyhood into manhood happened in one of these midnight experiences that they created for him. That they would send this boy into the woods to spend the night alone. And that when he came out in the morning, he would have become a man because he had endured that. And he could only rely on his own senses, on what he had learned, on his training. He he was isolated. He's probably 13. Isolated, scared, exposed. I'm sure every broken stick was a wildcat in his head, right? Every grunt was a bear. But when the morning came and the boy could see clearly, he realized that the men of the tribe had encircled him all night long that no wild animal would have ever made it to him because they would have killed it. He thought he was completely alone in the darkness, but the light revealed the truth. You see, joy and mourning changes everything. I don't know what your midnight experience is. I don't know how long it's lasted. I don't know what kind of toll it's taken on you. But when the morning comes... It reveals that there was nothing there in the midnight that wasn't also there in the daylight. That most of what you were afraid of was shadow and perception. It reveals that God has been there for you 
right beside you, encircling you, protecting you, watching over you the whole time. So let me ask you this this morning. Are you in a midnight experience? Then if you are, walk this path with Asaph and his choir and all of your brothers and sisters who are there with you. There will be a morning again. There will be joy again. And it's found in the relationship with Jesus that's built on faith and not on your feelings. Why don't you stand with me this morning? I said just a moment ago, I don't know what kind of toll your midnight has taken on you, but from experience, I will tell you that you will probably walk with a limp the rest of your life. And that limp is a blessing because it reminds you what you went through and not just of the pain, but of the faithfulness of God to bring you out and to be there with you the whole time. So if you have already been dragging that leg a little bit and you feel like you're in there again, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God was faithful to you then. He's going to be faithful to you now. And if this is your first midnight experience, you will not die. I'm not making light of you because in, in, in some of the ones I went through, I thought I might. You will not, you will live and not die and will declare the glories of the Lord. So hold on to him, not on what you feel from him, but on what you know of him from his word. We're going to, we're going to sing one more song together and we'll be dismissed. You've been very patient this morning, but I, I really sense this was a need among us. And I wanted to share this with you this morning. This altar is open for you to pray about anything that's going on in your life, whether it is a midnight experience, whether you have a decision coming up, a relationship problem, a financial problem, whatever it is, you are welcome to come and bring that need to the Lord today.